Okay, this is uh, AP Stats. We're going to continue talking about regression. I named this video Regression Wisdom because we're going to try to improve our wisdom upon regression here. All right, uh, the first thing I do want to remind you guys is the packet that you did in class on linear regression. The one that has the first problem is trying to predict body fat based on waist size. Um, all of the answers to every problem in that entire packet are going to be online in the AP Stats documents through my website through the uh, Twinsburg City Schools. So please check that out. All right. Um, First thing here, let's, let's read this problem right here. It says, John believes that he that as he increases his walking speed, his pulse rate will increase. Certainly sounds understandable. He wants to model this relationship. John records his pulse rate in beats per minute while walking at each of seven different speeds in miles per hour. A scatter plot and regression output are shown below. So first part, obviously, the x is speed, and that is the explanatory variable. The y is pulse rate, and that is the response variable. So we notice this... Um, Data looks um, fairly straight. Fairly uh, straight is really uh, obviously an important part. Um, if I had described this relationship, I'd say that it's very strong, positive linear relationship. I wanted to show you that I um, tried to enter this data into my calculator. I know you don't have the actual data, but this is fairly accurate, and you'll, I'll try to prove that to you in a second here. I tried to enter his uh, different speeds and his pulse rate. Again, I kind of estimated based on where I thought these points were, and I went ahead and made a graph, and the graph ended up um, looking very similar, so I plotted list one versus list two. Don't forget that every time you change your stat plot, you have to go zoom nine to zoom to zoom. And I thought I did a pretty good job of making that uh, um, on my calculator. And I'm going to talk about a couple things with that calculator as well. So I'm going to show you that. All right, now getting back to this, um, you know, hopefully everybody by now understands how to describe it. So as John's walking speed increases, his pulse rate increases as well, predicted. So the first thing is, like we mentioned before, and I'm trying to lead to here, is rather than have you guys do all the work, I will give you a regression output, very similar to this one right here. Now the first thing you understand, there's so much useless information here right now. Someday we will learn this. So this T and P stuff, we'll get to it, but ignore it for right now. R squared adjusted, Always ignore it. You do not need it. Analysis of variance, to be honest, we'll never really use that. Even when we get to the advanced stuff of this class, we just won't use it. So there's a lot of stuff you don't need. So try to shift through that stuff and ignore it for right now. The key thing you need is um, constant in speed. Next to constant is the y-intercept. So right there, 63.457 is the y-intercept. Next to speed is the slope. So I know that his pulse rate predicted equals 63.457 plus 16.2809 times speed. And of course, we can ask the age-old question, um, interpret the y-intercept. Okay, the y-intercept says if there is no speed, the predicted pulse rate is 63.457 beats per minute. And that certainly makes sense because you can walk with no speed. It's called standing still. And when you're standing still, you still have a pulse rate. So the 63.457 would actually best be his predicted um, resting pulse rate. What about that um, slope? That slope would be 16.2809 over 1, the 1 is the x, the top number is the y, the x is speed in miles per hour, the y is pulse in beats per minute. Um, so basically I know that for every 1 mile per hour that his speed increases, his predicted pulse rate will increase by 16.28 um, beats per minute. All that makes sense, okay? Um, R squared is 98.97%. What does that mean? Well, that tells you how reliable, okay, um, his line is at making predictions. So 98.7% of the variation in pulse rate is explained by the variation in the speed. Or you could say 98.7% of the variation in pulse rate is um, accounted for by the least squares regression line, the actual least squares regression model. Um, so how do you find R? Because obviously correlation is pretty important. So R is simply going to be the square root of the 0.9 eight seven so we take the square root of 0.987 and we get 0.9934 okay and again that's showing that this really was a strong positive linear relationship between speed and pulse rate now again I tried to do this on my calculator these values are not exact but I was actually surprised at how good I was able to do it when you run a linear regression again number eight a x plus b whoop I did the wrong one there uh, stat calc 
linear regression. Let's see, a plus b x. There we go. And um, notice the values I got slightly off, 63.86. That's because I estimated. So just bear with me here. 16.62 again because I estimated. R squared eh, a little bit more off, but again it's because I was estimating from the from the graph. Okay. So we get all that. Okay. So what do I want to talk about next? Okay. First thing is. One of the major questions that you're going to be asked is, is this appropriate? Is this linear model that we came up with right here, this, this beautiful linear model, is it appropriate to use? Two things that um, can, um, you need to give for the answer of appropriateness. One, check the scatter plot. Is the original scatter plot straight? It needs to be what we call straight enough. So I would say yes, the original scatter plot is straight enough. The second thing is that we need to check the residual plot. Now remember, most of the time on a problem like this, I will give you the residual plot if I'm going to expect you to refer to it. However, I want to show you on your calculator to find residual plot. Once you run the linear regression, and only once you run that linear regression, the residuals are created and stored for you in a list called, and again, you might have to scroll down for it, a list called resid. So to take a look at the residual plot, you're going to go back to your plot one. You're going to plot your x's, that is the speed versus the residuals. So I'm going to go and grab that residual list. And now, don't forget, you have to zoom 9 because you changed it. And there's your residual plot, okay? So the um, x's are still the speed, the y's are now the residuals. Now, what should you see in a residual plot? You should see nothing but a mix of random points, no pattern whatsoever. Um, and this is a good mix, some positive, some negative. Here's a big one, here's some small ones. They're going to be completely mixed up, and that's a good thing, okay? Um, if you look at a residual plot, okay, most residual plots have the negative going right, or the zero line going through here, and you see this pattern like this, a clear pattern in the residual plot. That's a bad thing. That actually shows that your original scatter plot probably had a pattern to it, because here's the regression line. If you had a bunch of, po uh, I'm sorry, a bunch of negative residuals, and then a bunch of positive residuals, and then a bunch more negative residuals, your original scatter plot was probably curved. So again, how do you know your line is appropriate? Original scatter plot needs to look straight enough. Residual plot needs to show no pattern. Nice, mixed, no pattern. How do you know that your line is reliable? How do you know that your line is good at what it's supposed to do? Well, that's based on R squared. R squared is an overall measure of how successful the regression is in linear relating x and y. I'll say that one more time. R squared is an overall measure of how successful the regression is in literally, literally, linearly <laughs> relating y to x. So a high R squared value, like 98.7, tells you that your line does a really, really good, nice, successful job at relating x and y with a linear model, which is, of course, what we're trying to do. Okay, so hopefully all of that makes sense, and hopefully that you could look at these computer outputs and get everything. The students that mess this up, the students that just don't study, the kids that just don't pay attention, they don't think about what x and constant are. Remember, next to speed, next to that word, first off, this word is always your x variable, next to that is the slope, above that, next to constant is always your um Y intercept. Everything else is not needed. So make sure you figure that out. All right. The next thing I want to talk about are what we call influential points. Okay. Influential points. Okay. Influential points are points that would dramatically change your slope. Change. Ooh, that's not. That's not a C. Change your slope. Okay. Now the thing is, these points are usually kind of dis, um, kind of hidden, but not really. Okay. So if here's all my data points. Okay. And here's a point right here. Now this is an influential point. A res an influential point is an outlier in the x direction, but not in the y direction. So in terms of looking up and down the y's, it's actually kind of right in the middle. I mean, there's definitely some points here that are higher y values, and there's some points that are lower y values. It's not an outline the y, uh, direct, in the y direction. It's an outline in the x direction. Okay? So if you think about the line without that point, it probably looks something like that. But with that influential point, the line is going to have to adjust, usually ever so slightly, but still going to have to adjust because it has to take that point into account and it has to even it out. Remember, it's trying to even all the residuals out. It doesn't want any major residuals. It's trying to get some positives, some negatives, some bigs, and some smalls. So an influential point oftentimes will actually look like it has a smaller residual, but in essence, it really, if it wasn't there, would have a huge, big residual. I mean, think about this line right here. If I extended this line, look how big 
big this residual would be versus the line because of it is a small residual. So again, outlier in the x direction, not the y, and um, oftentimes they have small residuals, but really they should have had a big residual. And the whole idea of they're called influential because they actually change the slope of the line. Now, the y-intercept also would probably change a little bit, but not as much, but still would change. So notice this line, the slope would decrease because of that point, and the y-intercept would increase. Or if I took this point away, all of a sudden my slope would increase and my y-intercept would decrease a little bit. Now, a point that's not an influential point would be a point like this. This is a point that's an outlier in the y direction and not an outlier in the x direction. Now, the, that point probably would not change your line at all. It might make the line, you know, go from here to here. But, I'm sorry, it's a terrible drawing. But, the point is it's right in the middle of your data. It wouldn't make a, a major change, okay? So, that's an influential point. Influential point is a point that's uh, going to um, make our change, right, because that's relating your slope and whatnot. It's going to make your slope change, and it's going to have actually an outlier in the x, not an outlier in the y, and it's going to have a um, small residual when it shouldn't be. Anyway, I also want to talk about something as well here. If we're going to use John's line here, John made this great prediction line right here that we've already talked about, right? If we're going to use it to make predictions, there's two words you need to understand. If we want to make a prediction with anything from 0.5 to 4.5, John's line is going to be pretty darn good. But let's say I want to know, hey, what's, um, let's predict his pulse rate if he goes to 7 miles per hour. That's called extrapolation. Extrapolation is trying to make predictions, extrapolation, outside of your data um, interval. My data was created from 0.5 to 4.5. Trying to make an estimate from 7 miles per hour, which is outside of my data, is extrapolation. It wouldn't be a very reliable um, prediction. Likewise, you know, I know what it makes, because it's fairly close, but let's say that it would have bought his speed of 0.1. Again, 0.1 is also extrapolation, because it's outside of my data from 0.5 to 4.5. Interpolation is good thing. Interpolation is, is predicting values inside of your data range. So if I said, hey, how about here at uh, 2.3, you know, 2.3, let's predict his speed. Okay, great, let's do it. 2.3, let's predict his speed. Well, that would be interpolation because that's making it a prediction inside of your data, which is completely good and legit. So we got extrapolation, bad, interpolation, good. All right, so hopefully um, that makes sense. Hopefully everybody's really getting really good at looking at these graphs. Hopefully you understand residual plots and the good and the bad. I want them to show no pattern. Um, appropriateness, reliability is based on R squared. Hopefully this is all coming full circle and making a whole lot of sense. And <laughs> look at that drawing now, it makes me laugh. But hopefully you really un truly understand these influential points and how they change the slope of a line. Small residuals, even though they really shouldn't be. So I cut these two green lines here don't look too different, but if you think about a residual with this point right here, um, it would make a huge difference in terms of the residual. So hopefully everything makes sense. We'll kind of recap everything on Monday to be ready for our test on Tuesday.